Hi everyone, today we are going to continue with another talk on distributed systems. We are going to cover Elasticsearch and the technology it's based on, Apache Lucene. So let's not lose any more time and get to it. In this talk, we're going to talk about Apache Lucene and Elasticsearch. Now, what is Apache Lucene? So, in a nutshell, it's a high-performance text search engine that's written in Java, and it's cross-platform and open source. It's very high performance. It can ingest up to 150 gigs an hour, and it has minimal requirements. It allows for fast incremental indexing and the end stored data is actually up to 80% smaller compared to the indexed text. It also offers very powerful search algorithms such as trunked searching, multifaceted queries, multi-index search, concurrent update and search. It, it's also a pluggable system and it's very, very configurable. Now, Let's go over how Lucene index mechanics actually work. So let's go with two documents that we need to ingest. Jim likes playing tennis and Roger Federer is the greatest tennis player of all time. Okay, so what happens is these go through on something called analyzer, which tokenizes the contents and it creates tokens. So for example, it's going to get rid of words such as is, of, the, and only keep all the relevant contents. This is obviously configurable depending on the analyzer you wanna use. So what happens here is you end up with tokens such as Jim likes playing tennis, Roger Federer, and so on. Now, these end up in something called inverted index, also known as reversed index, depending on uh, what literature you kind of read. And the result is essentially a hash map where you have the key being the term and then you have stored the frequency and the document ID. So what happens is we have Jim once, so the frequency is one, and the document it actually appears in is one as well. So what this allows you to do is very fast searching of text, meaning if you want to find the documents that contain the word tennis, you directly get the document IDs. You don't have to do a full text search to find which documents contain the word, right? And the frequency is useful when you want to do a relevance calculation, for example, in an autocomplete on a web browser and so forth. Now, this data is then optimized and stored in an optimized inverted index where it's actually compressed and actually very efficiently uh, stored on your data store. Now, Let's look into how Lucene stores those indices on your desk. Now, we already know what the inverse index looks like. So the frequency table we already mentioned is used for building relevance score. Now, what happens is that Lucene merges every three indices into a new index. Now, this factor of three is a default. You can change it to five or six or anything that suits the type of data that you store. So what happens is since it merge sorts every three indices, you end up with larger older indices and smaller newer one. So if you look at the chart at the bottom of the slide, you can see that how you have three individual indices that then get merged into one. Then you have the next three, the next three, and then once you get those three mid-sized indices, then they get merged into one larger. So this factor in this squeezing essentially has the end result of very large old indices and very small recent indices. So this is very useful, especially if you have time series data. So events that have happened recently are very fast to find because you have very small indices and stuff that have happened long time ago will take longer. Now, they're all findable in a single seek, so you do not have to do multiple iterations. And the results are again ranked and sorted, cached, and based on sort keys. So it's really, really fast.
Next up are the Lucene analyzers. So an analyzer is just a collection of text filters. So let's take as an example, parsing the sentence, a quick brown fox jumped over the lazy at dog.com. So the standard one being the default will remove the stop words, will lowercase all words and recognize emails and URLs. So what happens is you will get rid of words like the, and then lazy at dog.com will be recognized as a single token. So this again shows you that it's very suitable for web usage. You also have a simple one that just lower cases and tokenizes, a stop analyzer that will also split by non-letter characters, and you can also custom define one yourself. Now, there are quite a few others that come out of the box, such as the white space analyzer, the keyword, and the language one, where the language one is by far the most interesting and complicated because it actually tries to have some semantic meaning when it tries to actually parse that word. So it's something semi NLP, if you want to think about it that way. And the keyword analyzer basically looks at the entire sentence as a token. So this actually is useful, even though it sounds wrong at this moment, when you actually want to use an entire key word as a key, uh, sorry, key sentence as a key. So uh, for example, there is a phrase or a quote that you want actually to be the entire key, not the individual words. Next, we go through the ngram tokenizer and the Lucene date types. So what is the ngram tokenizer? So imagine you want to build an autocomplete, right? And what happens is your user will type in one character at a time, potentially. And if you actually want to have a very fast autocomplete, what you actually have is individual indices based on the number of characters. So you have the first index being for every character Q, U, I, C, K, for example, and you will have the document IDs immediately. The moment your user types in the second character, it will change to the other index that has the bigrams in there, and it's going to index by the two characters and so forth. So obviously you have a very big and demanding storage space because you need to store multiple indices together even and you have the data not duplicated but repeated as many times as possible depending on the length of the words and the length of the input you want to kind of store and allow out to complete for but the thing to bear in mind is that it actually has very good amortization because if you think about the English alphabet, you only have a limited number of uh, letters in the alphabet. So your hash map will not grow that much. And the number of combinations obviously increases as the number of characters input actually grows as well. So depending on your use case, use this wisely, but this is how modern autocompletes work. If you don't go for just uh, brute force scanning of data. Now, what are the data types supported in Lucene? So you have integer, longs used for dates as well, float, double, text, and binary. Now, text, you can have it as keyword string being not analyzed and text is analyzed. So keyword, again, if you want to have a sentence or multiple words being the key and text analyzed is where actually the a tokenizer will go through it. Now, that concluded what Apache Lucene is and what it offers. It's quite straightforward. It's very essential in, its, the, func in the functionality it offers. So now let's get into what is Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch is a JSON-based distributed web server built on top of Apache Lucene. So it gives you a REST API, it's schema-less, it's horizontally scalable and pluggable. It offers near real-time uh, data availability and it gives you also distributed system features like queues, thread pools, shared replication across nodes, monitoring, auto failover, and all these kind of goodies. Now, it is the middle layer of the so-called L stack where you have Logstash, which is for injection, 
and Kibana, which is for visualization of the data. The intended use is for full featured search for web applications. So this could be, again, like a book library, could be for storing your logs and searching them. It also offers out of the box out completion. And it's very, very good if you want to do fuzzy search, think what this is, is more of a did you mean feature what Google offers. So for example, if you had one letter mistyped, it will actually try to infer the actual word you meant. So it's pretty, pretty neat, something that comes basically for free for you out of the box in terms of functionality. Now let's look into how a cluster is set up with Elasticsearch and how a read and a write requests are processed. So for example, as you can see here, I have three shards and three nodes. You can see how they're all vertically replicated and horizontally replicated as well. So what this means is if an entire machine, meaning a data node here, goes down, I have all my data stored on other two machines. If also a replica fails, let's say a hard drive fails on node one, let's say shard three goes down, I have access to it on the other two nodes as well. So you have horizontal and vertical replication and it's absolutely amazing redundancy. Obviously the cost is having the same data multiple times, but if you care about kind of data preservation, this is really, really good. Now, this is important to note is that on each node you have a primary shard. So I have obviously very conveniently picked three by three to kind of illustrate this. So I picked shard one primaries on node one, shard two primary on node two and so forth. Now, what this means is that all writes are going to go to the primary shard based on a hashing algorithm. Now, the hashing is pretty simple. The request is taken, it's hashed, and then modulo of the number of shards and whatever shard number kind of is the result, that's where it's written. So you get somewhat good distribution across your number of shards. This is very important because when you set up your cluster and you choose the number of shards, you can't change them. Meaning that if your data increases dramatically and you need to now have 20 shards, you can't do this unless you create an entirely new index with new setup and you re-index the data into the new configuration. You cannot change the number of shards at runtime because of this read-write logic. Now, let's start with the write request. So the client sends over HTTP a write request to the router. The router then hits the cluster with Elasticsearch and does the hashing modulo number of shards. And let's say it arrives at shard one as a write, gets written there, it gets replicated into shard one replicas in node two and node three. And then once this is done, it returns OK to the client, everything is good, data is consistent, it is synchronous replication. Okay, so, so far so good. Now let's talk about the read request. Now again, you have client, HTTP request, read, router, and then it sends this read request to any data node. Now it doesn't matter uh, whether it's primary or replica. And once it sends to a data node, this data node becomes so-called coordinator node which means that it has the responsibility to aggregate the data of all other nodes and then send it back to the router. So for example, if you search for, let's say, books written by, for example, uh, John, uh, John Grisham, and say it has some of the books on data node one, some of the books on data node two and data node three, what happens is it will try to get the data from all three nodes via the transport layer to coordinate the search, to aggregate it and then send to the router. Now, this is obviously suboptimal example because as we already know, we have the data from the other two nodes and the two replicas on the first machine. So why should we go? Now, obviously the system is smart enough to know that if you have very high load 
on node one, because let's say you have a lot of writes at this moment, it will go to the other two machines that are idle and are kind of dealing with less load to be faster. If however, all are kind of idle, obviously it will take all the data from one node and not even go to the others. So obviously depending on load use cases, it is smart and optimized to know how to retrieve the data. So that's how the read works. Now, another designation that a node can have is ingestion node. So this is essentially the node that enriches the data before it gets ingested into Elasticsearch. So what you can have there is essentially some set of rules to clean the data or whatnot that gets executed before it arrives in Elasticsearch. You also have the designation of master node, which is the machine from which you can only edit the configuration for the cluster. So for example, if you want to change uh, some fields or some index types or any configuration really, it is only from that machine that you can do so. Meaning that if you have your cluster compromised, you need to have to go to this exact machine to do any changes. Okay. Now, in this slide, I have the Elasticsearch Lingua explained. Most of it was covered in the previous slide as well. So let's go briefly through it. Now we have a field is the name key in a document. It's similar to what a column name is in an SQL database. Then you have term is actually the value stored for that field. The document is in the individual record. It could be an entire book or just a page of a book, similar to the examples we did earlier in the presentation with the two sentences. And then the index is the collection of documents, which is schemaless, but you can also enforce to have a schema just for consistency. So you have the primary shard and replica shard concepts. We already explained them. And the data node, master node, ingest node, and coordinating one. So as we mentioned, these were again explained in the previous slide. Data holds the data. Master is the one from which you can edit the cluster. Ingest is the one that applies rules before setting the data in Elasticsearch. And coordinating node is the one that gets selected after a read request that sets the and aggregates the results and gives them back to the router. Lately, Elasticsearch has been adding more and more features. And one of the recent ones is a machine learning node, where if you have this plugin called XPack installed, you can actually designate the machine to do machine learning calculations on. Let's say you have a machine with a lot of GPU power that is excellent for this, you can designate it as such. Now, one of the popular questions is how is Elasticsearch so fast? Now, the reason is obviously inverted indices are hash maps and complexity is constant of one, assuming good distribution with the language you're using. Now, this obviously is not enough in the sense that this is computer science and real world is very different. The key is mostly caching and the usage of in-memory. So the thing is Elasticsearch takes a lot of memory and as we went through a few examples with the auto completes, completes, you can see why. Now, the other reason is that it does multiple levels of caching. So one is on request level where it excludes queries on date ranges with preset size, meaning that if your queries are, let's say time-based and they always have in the request now with the current timestamp, obviously you'll constantly get new milliseconds and so forth. So it will have really bad caching uh, hit rate. So for this reason, anything that has date ranges, they basically don't include. But there is a request level cache that essentially if somebody requests the same data, it will hit that cache and return it. There is also a data level cache, which is once it doesn't hit the response from that request level cache, and you actually have to go to the Lucene indices to retrieve it, the most frequently hit Lucene indices are also cached. So you don't go to disk to read it, you again go to memory. So these two layers essentially allow to speed up dramatically. Also, as I mentioned earlier, it duplicates data in multiple n-gram indices 
where it traced disk space for speed. So the takeaway here so far is the following. Elasticsearch is really, really fast because it uses a lot of memory. So if you're okay with disk storage and giving memory to this uh, kind of tool, you'll be perfectly happy with performance. In real life, what I have experienced is something around indexing, I don't know, maybe was it half a million documents, one million documents of reasonable size, it would take less than a second, which is really impressive. Again, it is not the fastest on writes, that's something to bear in mind, but it's really, really fast on reads. Now, what Elasticsearch also offers is its own language called DSL, and DSL is much nicer syntax than the Lucene one. Now, it offers a query filter aggregation, basically abilities. It is similar and not so much to the way you would write SQLs. So it actually, if anything, it's closer to what GraphQL is in terms of syntax, but in terms of the way it works, you can kind of equivalent it more to SQL. Maybe it doesn't make much sense until you actually start using it, but this is essentially what uh, what happens. So, for example, uh, if we have a query, uh, you will have bool inside, which is return this if it matches this criteria, and then you have a must, which is this is the exact criteria it needs to match, let's say a book by Dan Brown called the Da Vinci Code, and then the filter is a published and specify some dates, right? So you, you can have a hard filter, you can have a soft filter, depending on what you're looking for. Now, I will not go through aggregations and all this kind of stuff. It is very versatile language. If you're using Python library or any ready-made library, most of this raw syntax you're abstracted away from. So it is very nice and easy to work with. Now, uh, common questions I get is they have set up the cluster, but they're not getting the performance they would expect. So in this slide, I have put some of the tips and tricks for people doing Elasticsearch on what they can do to improve their performance. So one is use filters if relevant score is not needed to save on math calculations. So obviously, for every search, you'll get a relevant score you can disable this, but the idea is that if you want to keep it, reduce the number of results so that the calculation that needs to be done for relevance is reduced to a minimum. Avoid script-based filters. So you can do filters based on Groovy inside the DSL language. If you have to do this, you probably have a design issue. So I would strictly advise you not to do it unless it's like a one-off patch thing that you can kind of get away with. Performance is really bad using scripts-based filters. Um, also, search by round dates and avoid using now. Uh, the reason is, again, caching. And don't go overboard with nodes and shards. So what happens is, if you have way too many nodes and shards, your coordination node will have to aggregate from way too many places. But if you have way too few, you will have a hotspot on one node that does all the writes and you have a bottleneck. So you need to have good understanding of the data you're storing and how you want to store it in order to achieve good distribution. Also, avoid sparse records. Now, what happens is once you have your uh, fields kind of stored, and if you have a second record that populates only half of these fields, it will actually pre-allocate memory for the empty ones as well. So what this means is that it's terrible for sparse records because you will be taking space for unused data. Um, so with that in mind, the expectation is to still have all records populated and have very homogeneous data set. And lastly, use scroll query for large sets and keep results in heap versus size queries. So what this means is the following. Now, if you do a query and say, hey, give me all books by Dan Brown, and you set it to two, and he's written five, you will need to do this query a few times. Now, what happens is for every query, it has to go from the start. But if you actually set it as a scroll query, that saying that give me all the books by Dan Brown, 
and in this one I will get two and I will call you to get the next two in a second, it keeps all results in the heap. So your second query actually is just already taking the results from the heap instead of doing it from the beginning, right? So it's like paging. This is essentially the, the idea here. And they are really powerful and really good at optimizing the performance. And how to improve index performance? So yes, Elasticsearch is not the fastest on writes because obviously it's geared towards heavy reads, but you can make a few tunings to improve it. One of them is to have a predefined schema for the data you ingest. The reason is it will save the time of Elasticsearch figuring out if this should be a long or if it's a date time timestamp. So once you have the fields, it will also protect you from ingesting invalid data and having some mess in what you've stored. I also try to do bulk indexing. So send multiple documents to be indexed at once because it has internal optimizations. Have a dedicated ingestion node that is very powerful instead of having it shared with other nodes where it can have kind of multiple tenancies and multiple kind of responsibilities for one machine and it could also deteriorate with the performance of writes. Break your data by dates and it will reduce Lucene indices maintenance and potentially increase your index buffer size okay, to something greater than half a gig. Now, obviously, nowadays, if you deploy this in the cloud, most of these stuff are already done for you. So most of the things will actually not be applicable. But if you start from scratch, bear this in mind. Also, use auto-generated IDs instead of your own indices. It doesn't mean don't store them. It's just that for internal storage inside Elasticsearch, let it use its own auto-generated IDs. And also, currently, the refresh interval by default is one second for index re-indexing. If you can live potentially with five second delay, what would happen is it will aggregate all those writes, optimize them, and it will reduce the amount of re-indexings. So it will actually be able to focus more on resources to write to the store instead of constantly re-indexing after the new write. So, it's very similar in logic to what the bulk writes and bulk aggregation is, essentially. Now, few mentions around the, the plugins available. As a point in writing, the mapper attachment is very popular. It ingests PDF contents, DOCX, and all the open XML Microsoft Office types. You also have ingest attachment, which is based on Apache Tika. The Big Desk plugin allows you to provide live charts and stats for Elastic Cluster. You also are able to index documents over SSH and so forth. So obviously the ecosystem is growing constantly, but these are just a few notable examples by popularity, but feel free to kind of check it out. It is also kind of smaller by comparison to Apache Solar's, simply because I believe Apache Solar has been significantly older in terms of system so it has longer time to kind of build community of plugins around it. Now, in this slide, you can see a short GIF about what Kibana is and how you can visualize some of your data in Elasticsearch. So here, this is the default demo data set that is provided with Kibana 7. And it has a few fancy charts, a gauge, a bubble chart overlaid on top of a bar chart, a pie one and so forth. So you get the idea. It's very cool looking. It's very visual. It's excellent for kind of displaying to product and iterating. It also has kind of maps and you can kind of plot geospatial data and so forth. Now we're going to wrap up with an FAQ and some of the most popular questions. Now, the first one is by far, I deleted a document, my index size didn't change. Now, what happens is Elasticsearch marks the document for deletion, but it doesn't delete it until Lucene triggers an index merge. And the same applies for added a document. So you added a document, but your index size didn't grow. It is for exactly the same reason. So all these document modifications, the index and the space kind of evaluation, whether to free, delete, and so forth, 
actually aggregates a number of these events before it actually applies them. So this is good because obviously it improves performance. You don't have to kind of re-index on every single event, especially if you're deleting in bulk. Now, third one is I want to rename a field or change the data type after index creation. Now that's the thing, you can't be updated. The index has to be recreated and the data has to be re-indexed. I already mentioned kind of why the reason is and question number four kind of goes with the same piece, which is I want to change the number of shards in the cluster after index creation and you can't do this again. As I mentioned, the router mechanics and the module function, it will break the logic to which it selects which shards to write to. Because of this, you need to, again, new index, re-index data, and so forth. Number five, Elasticsearch, is it good for sparse data? No, we already mentioned it pre-allocates spaces on current index schema, so no values still take space. Again, if you're looking for this type of data store, of sparse matrix data, definitely not the place. Uh, look into different systems. Does Elasticsearch Lucene have an update operation? Yes and no. Update is actually delete and add operations and partial re-index doesn't exist at the moment. So this is something to bear in mind. I believe this could potentially change in the coming years as of time of writing, this is the way it is. So it is an actual delete and add. It, you cannot do just an update in place. So bear this in mind. Okay, the sources for this presentation are the official Elasticsearch presentation, which is outstanding. It's well maintained with plenty of examples. If you want to go forward, definitely go through it. I also went through the Apache Lucene documentation to kind of learn more about the basics. I watched a few videos uh, and you can kind of check them out here. And the idea is if you want to learn more, always go to the official docs, right? This is a rule of thumb. Uh, blogs are great, but things change. And if you want to make sure you have good understanding, always go to the official documentation. Okay. And uh, with those words, thank you for listening and uh, hope to see you next time. That's it. This wraps up our presentation on Apache Lucene and Elasticsearch. If you've enjoyed it, hit that like button. If you want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button. And if you have suggestions on what content you want to see next, let me know in the comments below. As usual, the presentation is available in the description. Okay, see you next time.